excellent. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for being here at the Lupus Ontario Symposium. Thanks to Dr. Tuma for kicking us off with such a great session. My name is Lisa Bilito, and I am a director at large on the board for Lupus Ontario. In addition to that, I myself have lupus, SLE, and Sjogren's. Sjogren's sy syndrome is one of the common comorbidities among lupus patients with several similar symptoms between the two. A very common symptom of Sjogren's is dry mouth requiring oral care. Our next speaker, Dr. Leslie Lang, will be speaking about the oral complications associated with dry mouth management, treatment, plus, plus tricks, with a focus on Sjogren's syndrome and its connections to lupus. Dr. Lang is a prosthodontist at Toronto Public Health Oral and Dental Clinics. Her role is to provide oral rehabilitation and as an immunologist, focus on oral treatment of patients with Sjogren's or other autoimmune diseases. Dr. Lang is an associate in dentistry at the Faculty of Dentistry, University of Toronto, where she has taught prosthodontics at both the undergraduate and graduate levels. Her research interest is based on the oral condition of those suffering from the autoimmune disease known as Sjogren's. Dr. Lang is also the president of the Sjogren's Society of Canada. They are also an exhibitor in our exhibit hall as well. Welcome, Dr. Lang. Thank you so much, Lisa. This is a delight and a pleasure for me to be here. Uh, I should explain what a prosthodontist is. Probably, <laughs> what is this? We're also known as prosthetic dentists, and so we replace missing teeth. There's also a category that we replace noses, eyes, ears, um, other facial features too. So that's what we do. Okay, so let's kick this off on the on the autoimmune disorders. So first of all, I would like to talk about the debilitation of the oral consequences of dry mouth in not only Sjogren's, lupus, but as, as well as some other autoimmune diseases. Um, as a prosthodontist, I'm going to look at some of the challenges that we have in treating the patients with a dry mouth. And I'm also going to end up with um, some tricks and tips on how you can uh, moisturize your mouth. So first of all, I would like to introduce you to my Gordon Setter, who all I would have to do would, would be to say treats, and I would get the saliva to be turned on. Now, unfortunately, saliva has a very yucky connotation, whether you have too much, whether you have too little. It even has some yucky names associated with it. And when I did a Google search on an image of saliva, I came up with this group from um, the Carolinas, a, a, a rock group. So you can see it's not particularly glamorous in its appeal. But nonetheless, poor saliva has been given a, a bad rap in that it has many beneficial attributes to it. Obviously, because it's associated with liquid, it will hydrate your mouth. It also is the very first uh, place where the digestion of carbohydrates takes place. Um, it would also lead us to taste perception, which you may have found with uh, COVID that you have lost some taste, but all this has to do with your amount of saliva. It certainly will be able to allow you to speak properly. Um, it will prevent the tissues in your mouth from um, ulcerating or help repair them. And as a prosthodontist, I must mention here um, that it will help not only um, make some of the dentures or removable prosthesis more comfortable, but it will help retain them. So with respect to saliva in the mouth, it will certainly protect some of your dental surfaces, whether that be your teeth or your soft tissues. Because it is a liquid um, and somewhat watery, it will actually help dilute some of the acids and it will neutralize any of these acids in your mouth. And there are even some enzymes and some minerals that are associated with saliva that can promote the remineralization of teeth if they start to become decayed. But just like the, the song that um, our good Canadian singer, Joni Mitchell has, has indicated, you don't know what you've got till it's gone. And once it's gone, you get a dry mouth. And I should note here that dry mouth is not the same as thirst. If you are thirsty, you can drink some water and it will relieve the thirst. However, if you have a dry mouth for whatever reason, it will not relieve the dry mouth. In fact, it may even make it drier which we'll get to a bit later. Now, there are two terms in the, the medical literature that are associated with dry mouth. 
Xerostomia is probably one that you've heard of. And this is a very fancy medical term. It's actually referring to the patient's um, feeling that their mouth is dry. It may not be that the there is actually any decrease in salivation, but the patient feels as though their mouth is dry. And I can look and I can see that there is indeed some saliva, but that is different than the term hyposalivation. Hypo meaning a decrease or smaller, and salivation is the ability to release the saliva. And if you have true hyposalivation, that means that the amount of saliva that is released in, into the mouth is less than normal. So think of the two terms, xerostomia and hyposalivation. Now, dry mouth itself can be associated with several different autoimmune diseases of which Sjogren's is one, lupus is another, um, scleroderma and so on. But we also have those patients who are being treated for head and neck oral cancers, um, whether it's respect to Im immunotherapy or radiation therapy, and they can undergo dry mouth as well. But I must mention here that the quality and the quantity of saliva is also different than it is from those suffering from autoimmune disorders. Um, with the, the radiation therapy, often the saliva will be shut off almost instantaneously. Sometimes it may even come back again after a few months. There are also over 500 common medications that are associated with dry mouth, such as blood pressure medications, um, antidepressives, also some uh, um, anti-cholesterol medications. And now that marijuana has become legalized, the smoking of marijuana can also lead to cotton mouth. Now let's look at Sjogren's a bit here. So Sjogren's is a systemic autoimmune disease, and most notably it is characterized by the infiltration of the immune cells known as lymphocytes. And that in turn with, with addition of antibodies that are being produced will cause the dysfunction of some of the glands that secrete um, uh, liquid, such as the lacrimal glands, which are the ones that are involved with tear um, secretion, as well as the salivary glands. The salivary glands are made up of three major ones, the ones that are in your cheeks and look somewhat like a cooked cauliflower with a straw coming out of it. These are known as the parotid glands, and they give rise to the watery amount of the saliva. At the corner of your jaw, um, there is another pair of glands known as the submandibular glands, and underneath your tongue, known as the sublingual glands, is a smaller pair known as the sublingual glands, and these two, the sublingual and the submandibular, produce the mucousy part of saliva. There are also hundreds of minor salivary glands, some that are in, on the tongue, there are some that are in your lips, as well as ones that are on your palate. Now, a new discovery made by those in the Netherlands just a few years ago, known as the tuberial glands. Now you may say, well, why haven't we discovered these beforehand? Well, look at some of these radiographs as to where they are. They're smack dab in the middle of your head. They are not visible if I look in your mouth. They are only seen by radiographic presentation. And the, the folks in the Netherlands were trying to create a shield that would protect the salivary glands when the head and neck cancer patients were being radiated or undergoing radiation therapy. And you can see these are the parotid glands, the ones that are in your cheeks. These are the submandibular and sublingual glands that are overlapping here. And you can see this is the fourth pair of, of uh, salivary glands. And here it is from the, looking at the top of your head where they're located and on a side view. And it may be that these are associated with the post nasal drip, which many of my Sjogren's patients um, comment about. So stay tuned for that. That's some upcoming research that I'm quite excited about. All right, so who is Sjogren? Well, Sjö Heinrich Sjogren was a Swedish ophthalmologist who back in the early 1930s um, had patients coming to him complaining of dry eyes. But not only were they complaining of dry eyes, they were also complaining about dry mouth and joint pain. And lo and behold, it happened that all these patients were women. So he published his findings, but unfortunately that was not considered to be very um, 
devastating. It was a rather minor uh, defect, shall we say. But I must um, emphasize now that it, Sjogren's has come a long way, such that in next year on Sjogren's birth date of July 23rd, we will be um, celebrating the 14th annual World Sjogren's Day. The hallmark features of Sjogren's have to do with dryness, such as dry eyes and dry mouth. Also, overall excessive fatigue, as well as pain, particularly in the joints. But those are really only four of the symptoms. There are actually 60 more, about 64 in total. And some of them are these are very confusing because they have patients who even tear constantly, as well as those who drool. This is part of a brochure that the Sjogren's um, Society of Canada has just released with showing you that not only is dryness associated with Sjogren's, but it is indeed a systemic um, disease where uh, lymphomas can occur. There's, uh, there are lung issues, liver um, abnormalities, joint pain, um, vaginal dryness, as well, peripheral neuropathies, not only in the fingers and the toes, but also in the oral facial region, um, gastroesophageal reflux disorder or GERD, dry cough, um, different uh, altered tastes in um, smell and, and taste, as well as headaches and brain fog. So not just a dry disease. Sjogren's itself primarily affects though postmenopausal women. It tends to have a ratio of nine females to one male, but there is also a component that features the pediatric population or the children. And pity the poor boy who suffers from Sjogren's because it is certainly not well recognized. Now, uh, just a few stats here I thought you'd be interested in. There are more individuals with Sjogren's than there are with scleroderma, lupus, as well as multiple sclerosis combined. Yet, how many people have actually heard of Sjogren's? Well, unfortunately, not many. There are about 22,000 Canadians suffering from scleroderma, about 50,000 from lupus, 90,000 from multiple sclerosis and a whopping 430,000 from um, Canadians with Sjogren's, which is about 1% of the population. Now, I just came across another statistic from the CBC who are talking about the number of nurses that there are in Canada. Well, there are 400,000 nurses in Canada. So even Sjogren's outnumbers the number of nurses. So why is it not recognized? Well, first of all, let's go into some of the challenges. Well, it's a Swedish name, and I apologize to anybody of Swedish or origin because it's probably pronounced closer to Sjögrens, but we've anglicized the name to have show grins, so you can show grins. We're a happy family here. Um, Sjögrens itself is not curable. It's not preventable at this stage. It's um, It cannot be prevented and, and it cannot be delayed at this moment. As I mentioned, it, it goes frequently unrecognized because the patients look perfectly well, that it looks as though nothing's wrong with them. And this is not only in the lay community, but also in the dental as well as the medical um, field. It frequently gets overlooked, is often misdiagnosed, and sometimes it takes anywhere up to almost even, excuse me, 10 years to be diagnosed. Um, Another um, challenge is how do we treat the dental decay? So let's just look now at one patient who was publicized um, or featured in a publication, I should say, in 1997. Now, is this Sjogren's? Well, absolutely, it, she had Sjogren's. Um, but if all our Sjogren's patients look like this, it would be very easy to recognize. You can see that not only does she have swollen parotid glands, the ones in her cheeks, but she also has swollen uh, submandibular glands. In fact, it's very hard for you to even see the edge of her jaw here. But this is, if this is what all the Sjogren's patients look like, it would be very easy to identify it. But instead, this is Sjogren's. This is Sjogren's. This is our one known celebrity. This is Venus Williams. Um, look perfectly fine on the outside, but suffering on the inside. Since 1965, there have actually been 13 different ways of classifying Sjogren's and three of them alone since 2002. 
One of them back in 2012 didn't even include the oral symptoms. And unfortunately the mouth gets relegated to the a back seat, no matter what. Uh, this is the latest um, criteria for, uh, for primary Sjogren's syndrome. And it is based on different weights of different factors. First of all, the patients undergoing a test for Sjogren's may have a lip biopsy. And this is what the minor salivary glands look like in the lower lip. And if these are removed, they look like little bubbles that happen to be anywhere from one to about four millimeters in size. If we stain these and look at them under the microscope, you will see that with the Sjogren's patient, there happens to be a, a, an accumulation of the lymphocytes in one area, and this area is known as a focus in both of these slides. And if there happen to be at least one of these foci, which is the plural, in an area of about four square millimeters, this is given a weight of three. We also do many blood tests uh, with various antigens and antibodies. And if the patient is what is called rho positive or has antibodies to SSA, that is also considered a weight of three. Various eye tests are done both with, with staining as well as the amount of tears that can be released. And each of these is given a weight of one if these are present. And again, here's the oral symptom right at the very end. And if we can collect less than 0.1 mils of saliva per minute of unstimulated saliva, this is a weight of one. So if you add up all these weights and you get a score of at least four, then this is significant enough to um, indicate that you have primary Sjogren's. Now primary, I must it, um, in, indicate here, that it doesn't mean that you, well, primary means that you only have Sjogren's, you have no other connective tissue disorder. Um, whereas a secondary means there's an additional one, but it doesn't mean that it takes a back seat to the other autoimmune disorders. Now I've been referring to this as Sjogren's because this is the familial form, but it also is known as Sjogren's syndrome with an apostrophe S. It also goes by Sjogren syndrome. And there, because syndrome tends to not emphasize the severity of the um, disorder, now it is being known as Sjogren's disease or even Sjogren disease, which is the terminology that the folks in the, um, the, the American society have, have used. And as I mentioned previously, we have talked about primary versus secondary, but as of this past September, when the 15th International Sjogren's Syndrome Symposium was held in Rome, and I must admit I was the only Canadian there, I guess that's a bit embarrassing, but at least I held up our flag, um, that, the, that terminology is going to be um, phased out. So the Canadian organization, and this is a plug for us, is the Sjogren Society of Canada, and this is our how to contact us. So let's look at some of the oral consequences now associated with dry mouth. This was a patient who was referred to me with Sjogren's. She was a nurse. She was very well versed in the medical complications of Sjogren's. And you can see with the shininess, there is some saliva there. You can even see with some bubbles of saliva but the condition of her teeth is not wonderful. You can see that there's beginning of decay and the decay in a, in a dry mouth patient, particularly a Sjogren's patient, happens to be near the gum line. You can see this is a gold crown that she's had in the past. So she's had some, some long-term dental care. You can see some splits and some staining of, of her teeth. And with the decrease in saliva, decreases not only the buffering capacity, but also the antimicrobial, antimicrobial capability. So about six months later, she came back and look at this. You can see that the saliva is now very ropey, very mucousy. She's even lost teeth. The roots are still there, but the teeth have broken off. You can see the beginnings of the decay here and lots of very sticky saliva. Here, six months later, look, look at the um, dryness of her lips. Her teeth have broken off, even more teeth have broken. So this poor patient went from this kind of situation 
to this. You can see the inflammation of the, the, um, the gums to this. Now you might say, what's that orange thing? Well, this tooth that was crowned, as I mentioned before, broke off. It had, it had originally been root canal treated and you could actually see the orange uh, gutta perca, which is a rubber material that we use in root canals sticking out to this kind of thing where the teeth have, have even split in half to finally this. And you would think that that would be severely painful. She had no pain whatsoever. I'd like to show here some examples of the oral situation in lupus patients because it is a little bit different, um, but in addition to the dry mouth. Quite often in a lupus patient, you will see that there are areas on the palate of redness interspersed with some white patches. There are also, um, this would be the lower lip, and you can see there are red and white patches as well. There are what are known as striations or stripes of whiteness on the cheeks here and in here. And there is more incidence of periodontal disease in lupus patients. And you can see from this diagram that there is bone loss here, in indications of A. Um, in fact, there in where B it was located, there was even some pus that was coming out. You can see the dreaded, um, in dentistry, what we call the dreaded black triangles here. There is bone loss. And you can see certainly that there's more inflammation of the gums. A paper was uh, put out a few years ago by the Sjogren's Foundation in the United States that was suggesting that one of the ways that patients can um, uh, manage their, their uh, caries or cavities is to use fluoride. But if you look more closely at this paper, the evidence is lacking. It ended up that there were actually only two papers that, that were particularly re related to Sjogren's and the effect of fluoride on their oral um, predicament. And one of them, uh, one paper was even looped in with uh, the head and neck cancer patients. And, and as I mentioned before, the situation in the oral um, uh, cavity of, of head and neck cancer patients is different. So even though this is promoting fluoride, remember that fluoride is only there to remineralize the teeth. It is not antimicrobial. So here's some food for thought. I've had many patients referred to me and they will say to me that they are on highly fluoridated rinses on a daily basis, that they use concentrated fluoride paste in a special trays that were made for them, again, on a daily basis that every three to four months, they have fluoride varnishes placed on their teeth by their dentists, and yet their teeth are still crumbling, they're still rampant decay. So why then, I would ask you then, is the fluoride actually working? Well, again, the fluoride is not there for antimicrobial um, situation. It is there to remineralize the teeth. But let's go back in history right now for a little bit. Father of medicine was Hippocrates, BC was the time of his life, who discussed the use of silver in wound care. Silver has been used in dentistry um, back even in China, um, 659, and it was known for its material properties, but also for its long known antimicrobial effects. And it is used in our silver fillings. Yes, mercury, I admit, is there, but the silver coloration is due to the silver of, the, um, of its ingredient. Now, recently in San Francisco, a study has been done using this material known as Advantage Arrest or silver diamine fluoride. And it was used for minimally invasive treatment um, to treat hypersensitivity of the teeth like those people who have very sensitive teeth, as well as those with extra cavities. And the way in which this works is that the silver will penetrate by the bacterial cell. It will be picked up and will interfere with the replication and causing the bacterial cell to die. In this SDF, as it's known, 25% um, of it is the silver component. 5% is fluoride, which is there for the remineralization of the teeth, which can occur once the bacteria have been killed. There's also some ammonia. Don't worry about that. That's only there to act as a solvent to keep this in solution. And this is a material that your dentist can apply. 
So let's just look now at the medical model of caries management. So remember that caries or cavities are caused by a bacterial infection. And unless we actually get rid of the bacteria, the decay will still be present. In the field of dentistry, we are known for the ones who cause drilling. We're, that's our surgical model. And unfortunately, drilling out decay will not necessarily get rid of all the bacteria. Just as sometimes if you leave one cancer cell, there, there may be a growth of cancer. Nowadays, however, we are trying to look at the more medical model, which includes the use of these antimicrobial agents as well as fluoride therapy of the um, cavities. And this is one of the only few products that has been recognized by the WHO, the World Health Organization. It's indication- Dr. Ling? Yes. Sorry, yes. I just need to pause you there because sure. we're just about out of time. Okay. Uh, are you almost complete with what yeah. you need to share or could we yeah. move to a question? No, I, I just, I would like to very quick, quickly, if I could just go through some of the um, tips and tricks. Okay, that's wonderful. Okay, Thanks. so I'm going to zoom ahead because I this is what I think you would like to know about and I can go back over anything else. So massaging, this is your parotid gland. If you put your hand on your cheeks and massage forward, that will help um, push the saliva out of the, the gland. You can also put your tongue down at the bottom of your mouth. You will feel the sublingual glands there. Um, this is what I, ca I call the oral Kegels, but that will stimulate a little bit of saliva. There are xylitol containing um, aspartame free gums lozenges that you can put in your mouth. Um, you can also put things like a button um, pebble or um, even a cherry pit. It's just something that if you swallow it, you don't want to um, choke on. But if you don't like the chewing effect, you can do this. There are lollipops that are available that contain uh, licorice root as the sweetener that is also known to decrease the decay. Uh, green tea, uh, we did a study on this and I will just jump to here. It will decrease the viscosity of the saliva. You can even use the mug as a warm compress. Water will not stay in the mouth. In fact, when you swallow the water, it will make your mouth even drier. Ice chips are fine. Spraying water in the throat will be fine as well. Something in your mouth like an or a prosthesis, a night guard, will stimulate saliva, and you can even put coconut oil on the inside. Coconut oil with a study was found by our, our group to not only decrease the decay um, causing bacteria, but also the yeast. The patients said their, their gums don't bleed anymore. They could taste, their teeth look brighter. They didn't have the sourdough um, paste. Some of the oral products that are available are, are these ones. I just put the lemons in. Think of lemons. Please don't use lemons in your mouth because it's very acidic. And I put this product up as well because, as I mentioned, there are oral lesions on the gums. This has hyaluronic acid. It is very good as a healer. So massage the gums with these toothbrushes, um, uh, Cure Prox that are very soft, water pick as well. Okay. Sjogren's and lupus are both very serious systemic disease. Ask your, your dentist about the application of silver diamine fluoride, and you can get a very aesthetic, inexpensive way of treatment. So thank you very much. I'm sorry I went over a little bit there. No problem. Thank you so much, Dr. Lang. We really appreciate all your insight um, and your tips at the end. Um, for anyone, don't be worried that that went quickly. We're going to have this recording, plus we will have the slides available so that we can share those tips with you. Um, so do not worry about that. Um, we do need to move to our next session now. Great. So although we did have one question about eye drops, Sharon will follow up with you on that um, separately than this. So thank you so much okay. for everybody. We're going to close this thank session you. now and uh, you can go to the session featuring Dr. Eltel. Thanks so much, Dr. Lang. Thank you. Bye-bye.